You're tuned in to More Living with Jim Brogan, broadcast live from the Brogan Financial Studios at News Talk 98.7, where old-fashioned values, expert knowledge, and genuine understanding come together to give you the retirement straight talk you deserve. Jim's a former National Advisor of the Year recipient and a financial educator, and he's here today to talk about how you can live out the best years of your life. Jim and the Brogan Financial Team have been helping retirees and pre-retirees across the Southeast for over 20 years in their pursuit of financial independence. You can reach them during the week at 865-862-6800. So sit back, relax, and get ready to learn, because more living with Jim Brogan starts now. Happy Saturday, East Tennessee, and welcome to More Living with Jim Brogan, where it's all about living the best years of your life your way. This is News Talk 98.7 WOKI. I'm excited about today's show. You know, the United States Supreme Court is, of course, the highest court in our nation. And as the judicial branch of our government, they interpret laws through the Constitution. Issues including affirmative action, guns, religion, student loans, abortion, and gay rights, of course, have all seen time in the Supreme Court in the last recent in the recent past. And this morning, we are going to discuss the Supreme Court. Maybe are there misconceptions that are commonly held about the Supreme Court? Uh, what is the impact the justices can have on our lives? And we'll talk some about the most recent rulings. Joining us today is local attorney Dino Cole. Dino is one of Tennessee's premier lawyers and has been in practice for over 20 years. He also happens to be a dear friend. Good morning, Dino. Good morning, Jim. Great to have you. As an attorney, he offers services. He focuses on litigation. He has a focus on criminal defense and personal injury. He also closely follows the Supreme Court. And he's going to offer us some legal interpretation of even some of the most recent rulings that have come down. And I know we had you on, uh, I guess, about a year ago, was it? We we had you on talk about Supreme Court stuff. About about, that's right. Maybe two years ago. Maybe two. Well, it's great (laughs) to have you back. Um, Dino, let's talk big picture. You know, one of the great designs of the U.S. government is the three branches of government, right? The system of checks and balances. And with the Supreme Court, it's ability it's its ability to check the actions of the executive and legislative branches through a power called judicial review. How impactful is the Supreme Court when it comes to keeping the government as a whole working for the people that it serves? Well, it's impactful to the extent that nine unelected justices can strike down a law that hundreds of Congress people passed and the president signed into law and ruled that it's unconstitutional or out of bounds beyond what the Constitution allows the um, Congress to pass. Article 1 of the Constitution gives power, it explains what powers Congress has. And uh, Article 3 explains what powers the Supreme Court has. But that's a, a, a very strong trump card, so to speak, that the Supreme Court can strike down laws based on another branch doing something that they seem as uh, unconstitutional, sort of like the student loans, which I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about. Sure. Stu- um, so, so talk about – there are mis- some misconceptions about what the Supreme Court actually does. Uh, talk about what type of – I mean, talk about the difference in a policy court and an error correction court. Right. Um, well – they only hear a, a small number of cases every year because they they want to be impactful, of course. Thousands of cases are appealed to the Supreme Court every year, and a lot of those are asking to correct the Court of Appeals that might have messed up, and they're not as concerned about correcting the errors as they are of shaping policy. Um, and what that sort of means is – they, they want to have a policy on this is what the Constitution means. This is how we interpret statutes in a certain way. And um, if you look back at how many of uh, the thousands of cases are appealed, in the past they would hear as many as 160 cases a year. Last year they only heard 58 or 59, depending on it, how, how you count the cases that were consolidated. And uh, what's interesting about Another misconception is that the Supreme Court 
is uh, sharply divided. But in more than half of the cases it heard last year, over uh, in 30 cases, they, they were 9-0. to zero. Now, that's kind of wild to me, Dino, because, I mean, there's – I mean, I have no idea how many cases are actually presented to the court to either accept or not. It's thousands, right? In, in it's in the term. thousands. It's gone down a little bit, uh, which is kind of interesting, but it, it's a difficult. You have to. It, it costs about five hundred dollars in printing just to try to ask the court to hear an appeal because there's so many booklets you have to send in. All the other courts are electronic, but they still have it on paper. That's cause funny. I, <laughs> so then, and then they select. Let's just say roughly sixty cases to hear. And in roughly half of those cases, the justices were unanimous in their in their ruling. I, I'm kind of like, well, how did it even get to that far? I mean, if it's so clear that the law says one thing, or the Constitution says one thing, how does it even get that far? Well, uh, you have two levels below if it's through the federal courts. You know, you've got the district court, which is the uh, trial court where you hear juries where you can have a jury trial or a judge might hear the case. And then if somebody doesn't like the decision of that judge, then it goes to the uh, circuit court, which is the Court of Appeals. There's 13 federal circuit courts. We're in the Sixth Circuit, so appeals go to Cincinnati in uh, uh, in our circuit. And then from there, you can ask the Supreme Court to hear the case. And that's, like I said, a very small chance of getting there. But you can also ask the Supreme Court to hear appeals from a state Supreme Court if there's an issue of federal, like the federal constitution, for instance, or a federal statute um, that a state court may have tried to interpret. That's very rare. But um, the, the the most important point here is that they only take these limited number of cases, so they want to make sure that they, it's a lasting precedent because they, they generally try not to overturn their precedent. That, that There's a concept called stare decisis where they try to stay with it. And there have been cases where they have. Which in the last two years has become more controversial because of some of the, the, the headline rulings. Correct, correct. And, it, and it's, a, it's a rare thing. They overturn their decisions, but it does happen. So you mentioned, you know, we've got nine unelected justices. They're permanent, they're permanent appointments. Lifetime. Lifetime. Uh, well, I guess not permanent. Permanent for life. <laughs> um, why do you think constitu- our Constitution writers chose to give the President and Congress the power to appoint Supreme Court justices rather than to establish popular elections? I, I, I think it was in their wisdom that uh, it would be a political process that they picked the, the, the brightest and the best. It used to be that justices were almost rubber stamped because they were vetted so uh, vigorously and you would see that uh, votes like Justice Scalia I think was voted 99 to 0 uh, by the Senate you're not going to see that anymore because we'll never see that again right and uh, district court and uh, circuit court just judges would also be likewise kind of rubber stamped in but I think the purpose of lifetime is, is to, to show independence. They don't have to uh, get reelected and rule in a certain way that, that, that goes along with popular opinion of the day. They, they actually will stay true to the Constitution, true to interpreting the law. Well, I could go down a rabbit hole on that, on that comment there, but we'll try not to get too down rabbit holes of, of the, on that one. But, you know, there's been some controversy about how do or do not justices allow their personal biases, their beliefs, their values, you know, their personal background and life experiences? Um, all justices on the court are adamant that they, you know, they don't rule based on political persuasion. They they rule based on the law and based on the Constitution. How hard do you think it is for justices to set aside their own personal beliefs when they interpret the Constitution. I think most of the time that they're able to do that, but when it comes to those uh, controversial cases or politically charged cases, I, I believe their personal beliefs do come into effect. Just It, it just shows. And, and there are probably only uh, – there's only six cases uh, that I count that were six to three along – party line, so to speak. So it, it – but when the, those six cases are pretty important, but uh, – the Supreme Court is is an interesting animal. 
every single justice went to, to Yale or Harvard, and they grew up on – most of them grew up on a coastal state. Uh, I guess and, except for the one, right? Uh, Amy oh, Coney Amy Barrett. Coney Barrett, yeah. Yeah, and, and she – you know, she did not go to Yale or Harvard. She actually went to college here in Tennessee. She went to Rhodes College and uh, Notre Dame for law school. But, uh, um, in, in fact, I think the new, our newest justice, Justice Jackson, sat on the uh, uh, Board of Governors for Harvard, which is why she didn't hear the affirmative action case. Sure, they, because conflict of interest. Correct. We're visiting this morning with Dino Cole, and we're talking about the Supreme Court. When we come back, we're going to get a little bit more into the way the checks and balances were designed by our, the framers of our Constitution. Have things gotten out of balance? Is this what the constitutional writers envisioned? So stay tuned. We'll have more with Dino. You're listening to More Living with Jim Brogan here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Welcome back to News Talk 98.7's Brogan Financial Studios, where Jim Brogan is coming to you live with important news and advice to help you achieve your dream retirement. Get ready to learn and live. Here's your host, Jim Brogan. Welcome back. This is More Living here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. And we're talking about the Supreme Court, the role it plays. Is it out of balance? And we're going to hear a little bit later in the show, we're going to get into some of the recent cases, especially the ones that are controversial. We have my good friend and, and one of Tennessee's top attorneys, Dino Cole, with us in studio when we're talking about the impact. Um, Dino, how does the nomination process for federal judges reflect the per- political principle of checks and balances you know if the senate and president are both from the same political party when they nominate and confirm a justice do you think the system still works as it was intended i guess i guess you know they started getting out of whack at least some people think so back in the fdr years because he was in office so long but t- what's your perspective on that well i i think it does play a role but if you look back to the history of our government you know our first president didn't belong to a party he uh, george washington was uh, kind of neutral in a way and the constitution was written prior to that date so i don't know that the founders necessarily envisioned a two-party system that a lot of people might argue has become more sharply divided than it has in uh, many years um but certainly if you've got a uh, uh a party in control of the Senate and a party in control of the executive branch, the president, you're going to get a uh, probably, let's just say you have a Republican president and a Republican Senate, you're probably going to get a more conservative justice. Not always. I mean, some of these justices have flipped in the in years past. If you look at uh, some Bush appointees, they sided almost exclusively with the uh, left wing of the court. Uh, you had some Nixon appointees, Ju- Justice Brennan, for instance. He was considered a conservative at first, but then became uh, very much a liberal and was considered sort of the the king of the, the liberals on the court for, for many years. He, he, was, he was quite the intellect. Um, I don't know if that's going to happen again because I, I think the vetting process has become more vigorous. You know, it's interesting because we, we focus so much on the Supreme Court. But and, and, you know, we have a Judiciary Committee in the Senate that nominates and approves the appointees. So they can't, you know, I guess there is a check and balance there to some degree. Um, but if the Senate has, if the, if the one party has the presidency and the Senate, that can be an issue, right? But then talk about the impact of the lower courts, that all the appointments that are being made in the lower courts actually has a pretty big impact on our judicial system. Well, it, it can, and, and especially in the, the, the appellate courts, because they can overturn the district courts, of course, and they can shape interpretation of statutes because the Supreme Court can only hear so much to, to I guess, fix it or make them in line. Because a lot of times you'll have different interpretations of statutes in different federal circuits, and those are typically the cases that go to the Supreme Court so they can bring into line all the uh, different ways of interpreting the law that the circuit courts below have done. But um, there has – it is interesting if you, if you watch the news and you'll see, well, this judge is, heard this decision. This judge was appointed by President Trump or this judge was appointed by President Obama. But 
their decisions are not necessarily political if you look at them a lot of times. There, there are uh, Trump appointees who have, have given bad decisions to uh, traditional conservative causes and, and, and vice versa. You know, you, you might get an Obama appointee or even a Biden appointee who makes a decision that's uh, – not real popular with uh, uh, somebody who's more liberal. Well, and let's 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 talk about that in this late, latest session. So there were roughly fifty nine cases total. Uh, so the the you know one thing we often hear in the media is that it's a six three balance in the court, conservative liberal. But in fact, only six of those roughly fifty nine cases went along those lines of 6-3 the way we would define party lines, right? Isn't that right? That, that's true. And, and, and if you look at, uh, you know, a controversial justice at, at the time, Justice Kavanaugh, he's sort of becoming more of a swing vote. He sides with uh, Chief Justice Roberts 95% of the time. There's nine justices of the Supreme Court. I'm sure everybody knows that. But just to remind those, uh, and that's not set by – Cong- uh, that's not set by uh, the Constitution. That was set by Congress. And, there, you know, there's talk about changing that makeup. But anyway, Justice Kavanaugh sides with Justices Kagan, who is uh, you know, president of Harvard Law School, considered a liberal, and Justice Jackson, the newest justice, who was appointed by President Biden 80 percent of the time. And he vote- voted the lowest percentage with Justice Thomas, who's considered a conservative yeah, see, that's very interesting, and I see here, and these are notes, I'll, I'll give you credit, these are notes you gave me <laughs> part of the show, but Justice Roberts voted with Keegan 82% of the time, but only 75% with Justice Thomas. So there's probably, I mean, it's, I think there's, what I'm kind of hearing there, Dino, there are misconceptions, but I guess it's those big controversial cases where it does seem to get a little bit more along those lines um, but Kavanaugh was not expected to become more of a swing vote, was he? No. Uh, traditionally, everybody considered after Justice Kennedy retired that uh, just Chief Justice Roberts was the swing vote. He, he's the one who swung the uh, uh, Obamacare decision, for instance, and upheld that as constitutional. And that was a surprise to a lot of conservative legal pundits, even liberal uh, uh, scholars didn't think that the court was going to go in that direction now you know as as we know the supreme court should be an apolitical arm of the federal government um i think what we're learning is rulings are not necessarily as along party lines as maybe we think but on the big cases the controversial ones affirmative action guns abortion Gay rights, it does seem to go more towards the the, the uh, political lines. Is How much of this do you think, Dino, is a reflection of the current political environment in general? Or has there always been a political undertone in the court? Well, I, I think there's always been a little bit of one. But th- there's one case that kind of st- stood out. Uh, a, a gay rights case was uh, 303 Creative versus Alanis. And it was a, a sort of a fight between a First Amendment right of free speech versus Colorado statute that protects uh, discrimination against discrimination. Uh, A a lady had a website designing company in Colorado, and she did not want to make a website for same-sex wedding. And the Supreme Court upheld her First Amendment right, uh, basically Trump Colorado's non-discrimination law, but then uh, if you look back in, to 1995, there was a case called Hurley versus Irish American Gay, Lesbian, and Bisexual Group of Boston. And the Supreme Court, in a 9-0 to decision, held that the promoters of that parade could exclude um, groups that identified as LBGT uh, at, at the time. Uh, and that was that was perfectly fine. And that was a 9-0 to decision. And even Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg ruled... Uh, against the LB, LBGT group. So um, I think – I don't know if that case was heard today, if that would have been the same Yeah, that's decision. interesting how over the last – I mean, that's 28 years ago. I mean, interpret I – mean, I'm kind of like, well, how does the interpretation of the Constitution in 28 years change so dramatically? And, and I, I think that's an indication of how politics maybe has become sure. more – Ingrained, ingrained in the court. 
I read. I mentioned the we we've talked about the lifetime appointment. That's become more and more controversial. Um, of course, we know the framers of the Constitution didn't want the justices bowing to political pressure with having to be reelected and things like that, and that makes sense. According to a recent poll by Axios, two thirds of Americans support Supreme Court term limits. Do you know what do you think are the benefits and the drawbacks? to lifetime appointments well some states have actually talked about some states have it on state on the state level uh like missouri uh you're done at 70 years old that's might be too young. Oh, wow yeah that's <laughs> but uh and that's even for trial level judges but uh well, I, th- I don't know i mean how what what the, the age thing well, finish your comment, and then we'll talk about the age. Well, I, I think that if you look at all the justices, regardless of their persuasion, they've all stepped back at, at, at the right time. I don't know that there's been anyone on there that uh, they've had to prop up like uh, Weekend at Bernie's uh, and uh, keep them on the court. to so where they, words, there's nobody that you can think of that, that was controversial, that maybe they were suffering cognitive decline, but they remained on the court. They didn't step down. Yeah, that, that's a more articulate way of putting it than I did, yes. <laughs> but I, I, I think that, um, I, I guess I'm, maybe I, 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 if it's not broken, let's not try to fix it. Uh, there, the, back in the 1930s, there was a threat of packing the court when Roosevelt was trying to because get his new deal. Because he was in office for so long, right? So he, was, he had such a long period of time, he was appointing the justices. Right, and before he was in several terms, they, there, there was a threat because the Supreme Court, prior to a certain 1935, they were overturning his uh, policies on the New Deal. And then when, they got, mm. when he got his justices in, his New Deal uh, policies eventually were upheld as constitutional Lot, there was, Which uh, was when Social Security was passed in the New Deal in 1935. Right, and there's a case called Lochner, and that, uh, I won't get down in the weeds about that. But uh, you know what FDR said? He said, "As I when he when that law was passed and it, and it implemented Social Security, he said, as long as I'm alive, you will never be taxed on your Social Security benefits." Well, what happened? Well. It, 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 we were also assigned Social Security numbers that were never. It was never supposed to be an identifying number, but really? you can't go to the doctor's office or without a Social Security. Right. Number. right. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. Um, now the Supreme Court has faced its share of controversy, really throughout history, but especially in recent years. And one that's recently been in the press is. The potential for conflict of interest with the reporting of gifts and the ethics of receiving gifts, and I know Justice Clarence Thomas has come under fire for this, should justices be held to the same standards as elected officials when it comes to reporting gifts? Well, uh, I I think so, but what's interesting is that there is no set of rules on I guess how the Supreme Court justices which is uh, all to follow. Yeah, they, they we I guess we just trust them. Are there rules in the lower courts? Yes, there are. And then you get to the Supreme Court there's no rules. That's right. That seems insane to me. And uh and and I've talked to people who know a lot more about the Supreme Court than I do and what what I've been told is that all the Supreme Court justices have enjoyed sort of perks that we hear about oh i'm these sure trips and we it, know they, it, have. It, uh, they they all teach these uh law school classes abroad and it's all paid for and uh they, they get all sorts of additional perks from from those sure. sort of uh speaking engagements that they have and seems like they should have to disclose the disclosure should be very very important at least maybe not to the i mean even if it's not to the public at least to maybe uh you, you know the senate a senate subcommittee or something yeah, yeah, they have, and the lower courts have actually tightened the rules in recent years about uh, potential conflicts of interest in reporting and things like that. Yeah. We're visiting with Dino Cole. We're talking about the Supreme Court. When we come back, we're going to start diving into some of the recent controversial decisions and their impact for down the road. We'll also have our dollars and cents segment: why the sixty forty portfolio might be broken. Stay with us. This is more living with Jim Brogan here on News Talk ninety eight seven WOKI.
Welcome back to News Talk 98.7's Brogan Financial Studios, where Jim Brogan is coming to you live with important news and advice to help you achieve your dream retirement. Get ready to learn and live. Here's your host, Jim Brogan. Thank you for tuning in. This is More Living with Jim Brogan, where it's all about living the best years of your life your way. You're listening to News Talk 98.7 WOKI. We're talking about the Supreme Court, and we're about to dive into some of the more controversial decisions of the last uh, session, which ran October to June. And uh, we have Dino Cole with us in studio, and uh, we'll be right back to Dino before we do. However, it is time for Dollars and Cents. Want to be sure you are getting the most out of your retirement? For all the years of your retirement? That's the primary goal of More Living with Jim Brogan and our Dollars and Cents segment, where we provide you with an important financial tip that will help positively impact the quality of your life in retirement. And now, here's Jim with this week's Dollars and Cents tip. Is that traditional 60-40 portfolio mix of stocks and bonds, the 60-40 mix, is it broken? Or stock and bond funds? It's such a popular mix. I can't tell you how often I have people come into my office and they have about a 60-40 or 70-30 blend, some 50-50, of stocks and bonds. And the bonds overwhelmingly are usually traditional U.S. bonds. Um. That, might be, that, that approach to asset allocation may be broken. I think it is, actually. And I don't think it's going to be very productive moving forward. Why is that and what can you do about it? Now, when we look back, the, the idea there is diversification. Well, what does diversification really mean? Diversification, to me, means you have a whole lot of stuff in your portfolio that doesn't just move up and down together. So, in other words, if one thing zigs, another thing zags. And that way, if one thing's like stocks or stock funds are way down, hopefully they're not all way down. So you have kind of different investments hedging other investments. And so you you, you reduce risk with diversification, typically. Well, if we look at and understand diversification when all this came about, Harry Markowitz developed modern portfolio theory in the 1950s. So it's been around a long time. We have to remember that when that traditional 60-40 blend was created, bond yields were averaging 8%. And the stock market was in the midst of a long secular bull market of 12% per year returns. And so, you know, the problem with always expecting a higher return from stocks is the potential of lackluster performance over time when we consider the big what I would call tail risk, the big loss potential, 49% from 2000 to 2002 on the S&P 500 and a staggering 56.8% in the Great Recession back in 07, 08, and 09. And so the, the, the traditional diversification of stocks and bonds in the last few years has not been as Diversified, meaning when one when one zigs, another zags. Stocks and bonds in the last several years have been moving much more in correlation with each other. And many economists believe that in the future, the true real return of a stock bond 60-40 portfolio, real return means how much do you beat inflation? It would only be 1% per year over time. And in fact, on risk-based portfolios, you really need to be in that 3 to 5% range over time in terms of your real return beating inflation. So that means if inflation is 3%, you're averaging, you know, 6 to 8% per year. If inflation, you know, that's what that would mean. But the, 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 economists are saying if inflation is 3%, you're probably only going to average 4% per year. And because people are living longer and longer lives – that becomes even more of, a, of an enemy in retirement because you need your income to increase for a long period of time because people are living longer and longer. So in today's world, we need a much greater level of diversification. We need more holdings that zig and zag. What are those things? Things like natural resources, commodities, energy, real estate, 
Um, there are non-traditional bonds that can go up with rising rates rather than down with rising rates. There are foreign bonds that help you hedge the dollar. So in other words, you're adding more things in your portfolio that kind of provide some hedges in various economic environments. Now, if you want a lot of risk and want maximum long-term growth and you're 30 years old and you're looking at your 401k, it's okay, in my opinion, more than likely, to have predominantly stock-based portfolio. But as you want to create more stability in your mix, that extra diversification is just going to become more and more important, in my opinion. That's our Dollars and Cents segment for this week. You can find this week's Dollars and Cents segment and others by visiting BroganFinancial.com. Do check us out at BroganFinancial.com. I also want to tell you I have a class Tuesday night through Pellissippi State Community College, Income Planning for Retirement. It is just a one-night, two-hour class at Pellissippi Hardin Valley. It's at 6.30 p.m. To get more information, you can go to PellissippiRetirementIncome.com, and you can download a syllabus and find out more information. You can also click to register. And then my next two-part class, Financial Survival for Retirement, is through the University of Tennessee at their downtown conference center. There's free parking in the Walnut Street Garage. That is on September the 12th and the 19th. It is two two two-hour sessions where I comprehensively cover seven different topics I think everybody needs to know about as they approach retirement or if you're already in retirement. Again, that's September 12th and 19th. You can go to to financialsurvivalforretirement.com. Also on my website, broganfinancial.com, you can click on classes and see the full schedule all the way through November, uh, through the end of the year. Today we're visiting with Dino Cole on More Living, and we're talking about the Supreme Court, and we're talking about some of the controversy. We've talked about some misconceptions with the court. Um, Let's kind of dive into some of this. You know, I know, Dino, of the three government branches, the Supreme Court tends to play the leading role in making sure to protect individual rights. What do you think the proper role of the Supreme Court is in protecting individual rights? And should there ever be restraints in that role? Well, we, we've got uh, the Bill of Rights and uh, additional constitutional amendments that give us all sorts of uh, due process of law protections. Uh, we're not supposed to be deprived of uh, life, liberty, or property. Um, and we, we have an enormous amounts of rights that the founders were concerned that uh, a despotic government would try to uh, take away those freedoms that why they set up the government in the first place was to be free from uh, England. <laughs> and so this, uh, uh, the Supreme Court sometimes has to balance those rights, which we talked about earlier, uh, non-discrimination versus a uh, First Amendment right. And um, that's, I guess, when, when things get controversial, uh, which rights are more important. And that's sometimes... A hard call to make, and uh, oftentimes these days those those calls are made along party lines. Let's dive into the recent session. We had affirmative action, student <laughs> loans, gay rights. You already mentioned the Colorado case. Um, let, let's talk about the affirmative action case, the the students for fair admissions versus Harvard. The case has a local tie. It does. Uh, the very brilliant attorney uh, had had the privilege of listening to him speak one time. Argued the case on behalf of students from Seymour for fair admissions. Yes, originally from Seymour, uh, uh, works in a DC firm, uh, works remotely, still lives in the area. And uh, one of the things that was remarkable is to prepare for uh, an argument that's only supposed to last an hour. This one lasted longer. He said he worked ten hours a day for thirty days straight just for the oral argument. Uh, but this case took 10 years to get to the Supreme Court from the time that it was litigated in the lower courts on up. A lot of interesting facts I learned. The Harvard lawyer six years ago, that there was a controversy over uh, getting attorney fees paid. They were charging $2,000 an hour to uh, represent. Years ago. Uh, six years ago, yes. Six, six years ago. So. Yes. Uh, who knows what they charge now. But uh, this case, as, as many people may be aware, basically overturned uh, affirmative action programs in college admissions. 
and uh, there was a companion case against the University of North Carolina, UNC. And so they, they fell on different constitutional grounds. One was the, the 14th Amendment and uh, of the U.S. Constitution and Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Basically, uh, that states that no one in the U.S. on the basis of race, color, or national origin can be excluded from participation or discriminated against in, uh, you know, if there's federal financial assistance, which is interesting that, that Harvard takes federal financial assistance when they have With a their fi- endowment. <laughs> yeah, they have a fi- almost a $50 billion endowment, which is the largest of any university probably in the world. And this case was brought by, gr- by a group of Asian students, right? It, it was. Uh, they were being... Uh, they, they felt they, like denied admission when they were more than qualified. That's right. And, 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 and there, there was a tremendous amount of statistics involved in the case from experts that testified about, you know, there's four categories that, that the Harvard would look at, and one of them was sort of a catch-all category of, uh, and of, of their well-roundedness or, or something to that effect. But anyway, th- this case came down on party lines, and um, it was... Uh, uh, yeah, it, 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 it was one of those six cases, right? Right, and after it was decided, uh, thirteen attorney attorneys general from thirteen states, including our own uh, Jonathan Scrimetti here in Tennessee, right, signed a letter uh, addressed to the CEOs of the Fortune 100 companies, threatening to sue them if they utilized uh, affirmative action or, or discriminated on the basis of race. Uh, especially under the label diversity, equity, and inclusion. You know, we hear about DEI these days. And so that could potentially turn the corporate world upside down. Uh, You know, no race-based quotas, no preferences, they said, will be tolerated, or they're going to sue the companies. And the attorney general has a right to sue these companies. So so, So big implications for down the road in corporate America. We're visiting with Dino Cole. We're talking about the Supreme Court. When we come back, I want to talk about kind of where we're headed in the future with the with the court. What are some challenges? What are some concerns? What what are his opinions on the best course uh, for our Supreme Court? So stay with us. This is more living with Jim Brogan here on News Talk ninety eight seven WOKI. Welcome back to News Talk 98.7's Brogan Financial Studios, where Jim Brogan is coming to you live with important news and advice to help you achieve your dream retirement. Get ready to learn and live. Here's your host, Jim Brogan. This is More Living here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. I'm Jim Brogan, and we're visiting with Dino Cole, and we're talking about the Supreme Court. Um... The, the uh, you'd mentioned there off air, Dino. You, you know, we had to go to break there, but we were talking about that affirmative action case. Um, continue on that thought. I know there was a little bit more you had to add there. Well, I, I was just going to say that uh, another letter came out from uh, some conservative law group that was uh, sent to all the law schools, saying that if your policies aren't changed, we're going to continue to bring lawsuits because. They can actually obtain attorney fees if if the court determines that there was a violation of a constitutional right. And so um, Harvard, in response, has changed their admissions policy. But uh, if you look back at at, uh, uh, Prop 209 in California back in the 90s, it said that basically it's it's, it's like this decision that the public schools of of, uh, universities of California could not have affirmative action. And then they tried to overturn that. Uh, the the uh, legislature of California put it, put a proposition again for the voters, and they voted it down, interestingly enough, in California. So the voters of California said, we don't want affirmative action in our, yeah, in, in, in our university. We don't hear that much. Right, right. Uh, th- that's not – it wasn't very well uh, publicized. But the other implications, I, I guess we we're just talking about the, the lawsuits that could potentially occur – it's it's going to have a, a, a you know the challenge is how do we continue to have diversity in universities and and it's and, a cha- it is a challenge and and, and um there there uh, one way Harvard is trying to address it is by allowing uh, applicants to talk about how race has affected their upbringing and um you know whether or not that that's an impermissible factor that can be considered that that that'd be up for a future court to determine oh goodness. 
Um, so the rulings in this last session, especially on the big things, affirmative action, student loans, of course, that were struck down, the, 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 the proposal by Biden, executive action, gay rights. And then last year we had abortion, guns, religion, climate change. Many think that as we move forward, these are more conservative interpretation of interpretations of the Constitution. Do you know, what's your opinion of the long-term impacts? And do you agree with that? Well, I I think that a lot of the, the, the pundits have been surprised. If, if you take just a, a, a kind of a not-so-important case, there was a case called National Pork Producers Council versus Ross. California had certain uh, a law that says that any pork imported into California has to be humanely produced, whereas you know the, the, this National Pork Council didn't think that was fair, and they said it violated what's called the Dormant Commerce Clause. And they spent they spent a whole day in law school explaining what that is. Basically, that says a state can't pass protectionist measures to favor in-state businesses, and everybody assumed that the Supreme Court was going to go for the National Pork Producers Council against California's law. But instead, it went the other way. It was five to four decision, but you had liberals and conservatives on both sides. That, 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 it was the, not along the part the traditional party lines. That's right. You, you had you had some conservatives in the minority and some liberals in the majority, or, and also in the minority. But uh, uh, there was another case about the uh, Telecommunications Act where they thought that 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 uh, you know they would go against Google that sends you unwelcome ads, but Supreme Court upheld that law and, and, and didn't even write an opinion about it. They did what's called a procurium, a procurium decision and sent it back to the, the lower courts. So it, 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 I don't think it's as activist so maybe as— maybe show, shows that there is more neutrality there than maybe we realize, maybe, the, the, you know, that we hear in the media and all that. Yes, and, and I'd like to think that's true. Um, and, and there's another case, too— uh, uh, Texas and Louisiana sued the Biden administration about the enforcement of illegal immigration, and they they challenged the enfor- enforcement guidelines. They thought that the Secretary of Homeland Security was not enforcing their guidelines for deporting and arresting people that were here illegally. And um, in an eight to one decision, they said you don't have standing to sue. And and a lot of the legal pundits thought that would be an easy win for texas and louisiana and said they lost eight to one eight to one so it wasn't even close right um dino real quickly here i know um we think about things like packing the court with with certain ideologies there's been a lot of talk of late about expanding the court to more people and that's typically comes from the party that has less appointees on the court and you know i think one of the advantages of a fixed number is we don't get this seesaw back and forth or this pendulum that just keeps swinging back and forth what is your opinion do you think are, are you in favor pack of, of expanding the court and do you think that could happen in the foreseeable future well i think that nine justices has, has worked for us for her a long time and uh, there was a time when there was a different number of justices uh over a hundred and maybe two hundred years ago I, i'd have to look at my history but there, there were different numbers at one point but uh, obviously, it's it's good to have an odd number so you can get a decision. Because if say one justice recuses themselves and you have an even number, yeah. if it then then the lower court decision stands uh, if, if they don't have if it's a majority a split, four four. That's right. If it were four to four, um, so I, I I I think it's a it's more political talk than anything else, and. It's a way for one party to dilute the other party's majority. Um, As an aside, how many justices do we have on our Tennessee State Supreme Court? Well, there's five. Five. And and, and Tennessee uh, Supreme Court uh, justices are, again, appointed by the the governor and then approved by the – uh, our legislature. Dino Cole, how, how can people find out more about your firm and, and get more information? Uh, Dino Cole dot com, D E N O C O L E, or 281 8400. 281 8400. Or Dino Cole.com. That's it. D E N O Cole.com. That's right. Dino Cole, good friend of mine. Always good to visit with you. Uh, we visit on a lot of things, but it's fun to be on the air and talk about the Supreme Court. Thank you for taking time out of your schedule. Thank you. It's been fun. Today we've talked about the Supreme Court and protecting our liberties because greater liberty liberty provides for more living so you can live the best years of your life your way. Many thanks to Eric for engineering the show. Great to see you again, Eric. Thanks to Jill for helping produce the show. 
Thank you for tuning in. We'll be with you next week as you listen. You've been listening to More Living with Jim Brogan right here on News Talk 98.7 WIOKI. Have a very blessed weekend. The views expressed by Jim Brogan and his guests are not that of Cumulus Media. Any discussion of financial, legal, and tax planning strategies is not intended to be individualized advice and is general in nature. Always consult with your advisor for advice specific to your needs. This program's content does not represent a recommendation of any particular security, strategy, or investment by Jim Brogan or Brogan Financial Incorporated.